Landau Center for Research and Mathematical Analysis and Related Areas, I welcome you to our annual event, the Landau Lectures for 1997-98. Uh, most of you know that this is an annual event where what we usually do is to invite a nationally acclaimed, world-renowned mathematician who in the normal course of events doesn't find his way to, uh, to Israel or Jerusalem. And in this way, we try to expose ourselves and our students to the kind of mathematical goods. Now, this was basically the idea, certainly in the past. <coughs> the, uh, the Landau lectures who have already been here uh, consist of the following list, so I can miss anyone. Uh, uh, Jay Moser, Guy Bambieri, Ryan Sinai, Jay Leones, uh, W. Thurston, and S. Hildebrandt, certainly all well-known mathematicians, and I think at least two of them made their first visits to Israel and Jerusalem, uh, the last two, in fact, Thurston and Hildebrandt, uh, under this venue, and uh, so it, I think it was a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, this year, we sort of have deviated from this approach, Namely, we have not deviated in the quality of uh, lectures. There is no one who will argue that by any measure, uh, Professor Peter Sarnak is internationally acclaimed, world renowned. <laughs> However, we cannot say that this is his first trip to Jerusalem. He has been a frequent visitor here, some for short term visits and long term visits. And the fact that we have uh, invited him to be the Lambda lecturer only attests to the great esteem which we hold for him for his mathematics and, uh, and personality goals. <laughs> so, uh, so I could go on basically and tell you about Sarnak that uh, his, uh, his current research interests are, are number theory, uh, but I think that that's too limiting for, for him. He's also interested in problems in analysis, geometry, function theory, and I think he has one of the people who has a rather broad view of uh, mathematics and the way that different parts of mathematics interrelate with one another. And I could probably go on and tell you more about his accomplishments, but that would be cheating you because we've all come to hear him, uh, so why should I take the time? I think we'll all profit more from hearing uh, Peter. So I give you Professor Peter Sarnak of Princeton University, the Landau Lecture of 1997-98, and the topic of his talk, of which there will be three, another one on Sunday, another one on Tuesday, zeros of zeta functions and applications to arithmetic. Does this work? It's working? Well, thank you uh, for embarrassing me. <laughs> also, uh, and now that he has that thing, <laughs> makes it a little. I had some, yeah, I had some perhaps more juicy things to say, but I'll be careful now. Uh, of course, it gives me great pleasure to give these lectures, and uh, I think Landau, uh, well Landau was sort of a father of the subject of analytic number theory in the century, and uh, as you'll see, I've chosen the topic to coincide with some of his interests. Um, and also, many of the visitors, they, this is just coming off a conference that just occurred and many of the people here are experts and uh, the subject matter I'll talk about I think might be dear to them too. So I hope I can keep everybody from sleeping, but let's see how it goes. Also I will use an overhead, so when you jet lag, maybe on the second and third lectures it's better to use a blackboard, but I found that uh, this will prompt me when I forget what I want to say. I look here what's written, it reminds me what to say. Okay, so the subject is that of zeros and especially their influence on arithmetic. Uh, so let me start at perhaps the beginning. Uh, so uh, is this focused? Everybody see that? So I'm going to stand here and I don't move much, so if you can't see now, you're not going to see, but if you can see now, you'll probably see for most of the lecture. The one thing I did add to these lectures is symmetry. It's something I want to emphasize its role 
in distribution questions of, of perhaps a somewhat different type than has been investigated until recently. But I must start at the beginning and I start with what is my favorite theorem in all of mathematics perhaps and perhaps some other people find it as attractive. It's the theorem of Dirichlet which simply asserts that if you have two numbers a and q which are relatively prime which is a clearly necessary condition from wh what I'm about to say then in fact there are infinitely many primes which will give remainder a when divided by q. And not only are there infinitely many such primes, but the primes don't prefer, at least at first sight, to be giving, they don't have preference to any of the A's. They equidistributed amongst these residue classes modulo Q. And it's best to put these residue classes modulo Q into a group, Z mod QZ star, the invertible elements, is a finite abelian group. And in fact, in his proof, the Richley introduces a number of tools and the tools are of Fourier analysis, for one. So, for example, he starts out by, in this proof, which I won't go through, just say a few words about it, uh, introducing characters of the group. These are multiplicative functions into the non-zero complexes and hence necessarily into the circle. So they s satisfy chi of mn is chi of m times chi of n. And you extend this to the integers by setting chi of m to be zero if the numbers are not relatively prime. So chi is periodic of period q, and I ask you to keep that in mind. This period is a very important notion, sometimes called a conductor. And I, for experts, I may occasionally drop. Take analysis of the group in question here enters, and the thing he introduced, which we call L functions, and I've never really been able to determine myself why they're called L functions. Directly, I think his initial, I think his name was a little different. There was some L in his name, and that much I remember. But we've stuck to this L function ever since. And the L function is the following series, summation chi n over n to the s. And its importance in the theory of primes is it's also a product over primes of 1 minus chi p, p to the minus s to the minus 1. All this he analyzed for the real var variable s, s bigger than 1. And this product uh, to sum is just the unique factorization of primes and the multiplicativity of chi. But of course, if I put your s equal to 1, then that's product 1 minus chi p, p to the minus 1. And uh, for those of you, if I put chi equals 1, this gives, because the harmonic series diverges, this already gives me infinitely many primes. That was observed by Euler. And the Richler is extending on this idea, building in harmonic analysis at the same time. Now, I immediately go to the beef of his proof. The key in the proof is to prove that the value in s equals 1, so suppose chi is not the trivial character, chi is not 1. The key in his proof is to show this number, which is a con conditionally convergent series, or that product, is not zero. That is the heart of the whole proof, and it's very easy to establish this when chi is a complex character. That means it takes, comp so at least it's not real, or its square is not one. And he's reduced to the real case, chi is real, and like all great theorems, in order to just deduce the infinitude of primes in progressions, he's forced to prove something highly non-trivial that that function is not zero, that value is not zero. And to do so, he, he discovers another formula. He expresses this in terms of class numbers of quadratic fields, and class numbers are greater than or equal to one, and he concludes the number is not zero. So that is just a lemma along the way, but a lemma which has become a very important piece of mathematics. Now, I will not describe the class number. It's not the direction I want to go in. I want to go into the zeros of L, zeta or L functions. And here we've already faced immediately the issue of this not vanishing there. His proof gives a lower bound of L1 chi q, which is by no means obvious if you're an analyst and just look at that series. These chi's change sign. Why should this be firstly non-zero and then bounded below by, uh, maybe there's a constant of a quarter or something, a q to the minus a half. If chi is odd, meaning chi of minus 1 is minus 1, and log q over q to the half if chi of minus 1 is plus 1. Remarkably, these lower bounds, well, this I will describe has a slight improvement, but they still stand today after all these years as the best we know. And I want to explain to you that improving such a thing is not just some kind of punishment we enforce on ourselves. <laughs> it's an absolutely central problem in modern number theory. So, he gave this lower bound, and it still stands as essentially the best we know. Let me tell you what one expects first. 
there's going to be something, a fundamental a conjecture that I like to say is a very good conjecture, the Riemann hypothesis, and from that one certainly gets much better than what I write here, but we at least expect, and I will just be a little loose here, that we should be able to bound this L1 chi by log to a power. There's an exact behavior there that little would discover under the Riemann hypothesis, but I don't want to go into that. I want to distinguish between Q to minus a power and log Q to any power A. And I will say, now that this notion of Ziegel zero I'll return to, I'll say this bound, just you can ignore this comment, means there's no Ziegel zero. The notion of a Ziegel zero is not something that's properly defined in the literature, and each author will make use of it as they like in cooking whatever they want to cook, let's say. <laughs> so, but the important thing is we want a lower bound of that type, and the reason it's called the Ziegel zero is because Landau really found it, so here's my first controversial statement. Uh, I will call this the Landau Ziegel zero, and there's perhaps no better place to start changing the name, and everybody may ignore me, but I will do it here. And I went to the library here, and also at Princeton, uh, after Ivanitz, who's here, pointed something out to me. There's a very famous theorem of Ziegel in Acta Arithmetica I in 1935, in which he proved a remarkable theorem, an absolutely remarkable theorem, and that was about a lower bound for L1 kite, resolved immediately a number of problems. Uh, I will get to some applications, so bear with me if you, this looks like something, uh, as Hardy liked to say, in the backwaters of mathematics, some lower bound of this type, but he proved that given any positive epsilon, there is a constant C epsilon, which is also positive, it's entirely ineffective, I'll return to this in a second, but this is a tremendous defect, but it still exists, such that L1 chi Q is bigger than C epsilon Q to the minus epsilon. So for our fixed epsilon, so epsilon is one-tenth, there is a constant so that this doesn't go, this is bigger than Q to the minus a tenth. This is a remarkable theorem and it goes by the name of Ziegel's theorem, it's in Acta Arithmetica 1. And, and the first uh, Landau speakers, I just learned a, a moment ago, Jürgen Moser, who wrote a lot with Ziegel, told me the following story, let me repeat it for you. Uh, Ziegel has some kind of sense of humor, I don't know. Uh, he, this paper of Ziegel is three pages long. He had been invited to dinner to Landau. Now Landau, you can see the picture out there, is quite a stuffy guy. Uh, and apparently this is the story that Ziegel used to tell that uh, Landau asked him uh, to dinner and he said could, I, could he bring his father, his father was a carpenter, Ziegel's father. Landau was a very high rich man and he said no. So Ziegel was quite upset but he went anyway and at that meeting, uh, that evening, Landau showed him a theorem which is a very good approximation to this, a slightly weaker result. Uh, and Ziegel listened and went home and realized how you could prove much more. You could get this result. And he wrote back to Landau a postcard. This is, I'm just repeating the story. And on the postcard he had, well, you invited me over. It was very interesting what we discussed. I showed it to my father when I got home. <laughs> and he found a much better result, which I will give the proof of on the postcard, which he proceeds to do. And that's his famous theorem. Now that is kind of amusing, I, I like that, and that's how we all believe it because this goes by the name of Ziegel's theorem. But I learned very recently that in fact Landau published his paper in the same volume. Nobody refers to it in the West, at least I hadn't seen it until very recently. And in his paper, he, get, he has the basic ideas here, he gets a slightly weaker result. The results are really due to Landau. And remarkably, Ziegel in his paper makes zero reference to Landau. <laughs> so I think he tells his joke because he felt guilty. He never wrote any other paper on the subject of this type. So, it could... Okay, I will explain what ineffective is. Ineffective means, now this is a sign of, well, Ziegel is the king of ineffective, firstly. It means that you give yourself epsilon equal to tenth, then there is such a number, but he cannot give you, in principle, a number. It's not that he's lazy. The proof goes by contradiction. It says, suppose something happens, then something, then he will give you an effective bound. But if, if it never happens, then you also get a bound. But since you don't know which case happens, you actually can't put a number there. And I'll return how this hurts you in many theorems in a second. So it's ineffective. There's no, if you put epsilon equal to one quarter there, there is no number that anybody knows in this world, like 10 to the minus a billion. We don't know that that works. But we know there is a number. So you might question what the hell we prove. So that's sort of, it's the same, by the way, with uh, Tua's method, 
in Diophantine in equations, also ineffective. A model is ineffective in the size of the solutions, and you'll see in a second this. this one. So nothing is known that's effective for epsilon between zero and a half. The only improvement of any substance, and it's, you're going to see just a little log, is a celebrated result. And this is not a joint work altogether. It's really Gro Goldfield, one paper, and Gross, I guess, separate paper. And they proved that there's an effective constant. They wrote it down, 10 to the minus 120. I can't remember what it is, but we're not this feasible, useful, and then there's just in principle effective. This was actually used to solve a number of problems. And that cell one chi, when we in the, in, in the uh, odd case, is bigger than this constant, which is effective, log q over root q. So this is way weaker than that, but it's a little bit better than Dirichlet. And already that's enough to solve a famous problem of Gauss, which was solved before by Stark and Baker of class number one, but the general class number problem effectively. And this already used the tools that I will return to a little bit later, modular forms, especially L functions of elliptic curves. It's a rather beautiful uh, piece of work. So this is the only improvement we know in the effective world. Now I promised, why are we interested in, in a lower bound like this? Well, and I'll give you an example of where this is used and where if you were effective, you would be able to do a lot better. And I don't want to mention the class number problem because that's been written about a lot. Let me mention a problem that also goes back to Gauss and some recent work uh, related to this. So a problem that we understand is which numbers are sum of three squares. This is in Gauss's Disquestion. It's a beautiful theorem he proves. He tells you exactly which numbers are sums of three squares. Sums of four squares as today are, and four variables and more easy and two variables are quadratic field theory and three is by far the most interesting and it's been a challenge for many, many years to understand them. But this particular form, x squared, one squared plus x, two squared plus x, three squared, which numbers are sum of three squares? Gauss already solved it. But somehow there's a little miracle with this form and he showed that if n is not of the form uh, 4 to the a, 8b plus 7, which is simply the condition that this is solvable modulo L for every L or modulo P. Solve it. You, you, clearly, if you have an integer solution, you must have a solution in congruences. And to decide whether you have solution in congruences is easy because there are only finitely many primes you have to worry about. And then it's a question of progression. So this is all very concrete. And Gauss, uh, this is the local condition. And if you're locally solvable, you're globally solvable. That's Gauss's theorem here. Yeah? And it's a beautiful result. And since then, people have wondered what happens if you replace this quadratic form by a more general quadratic form. And that's actually only recently do we understand that. It was unsolved for many, many years. For example, any general quadratic form over the integers, positive definite. Take this one, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus 10x3 squared, or better still, take this one that I went to the library to get here. It's uh, one that Kaplansky found recently. It's not diagonal. But this quadratic form here represents every odd number over the integers. So, uh, there are not many ternary quadratic forms that are going to represent every odd number. We know that locally this represents every odd number. So the beautiful question is every odd positive number represented by that form. The answer is we don't know. This is an example of a nice unsolved problem, but we are almost at the verge of knowing this. Why? Because there's this absolutely stunning theorem of 10 years ago by now <laughs> of Duke and Ivaniets that if you're given any ternary quadratic form, then every sufficiently large square free, there's a bit of a rub square free, but that I don't think, that'll be removed if somebody just had some energy. So let's not worry about that condition. If every sufficiently large square free end for which you can solve it locally, the congruences, is in fact represented by F. So it is true that if you're sufficiently large, you will be, so it is true that in Kaplansky's form, every sufficiently large odd number is indeed represented by that form. But here's where the effectivity hits you, or non-effectivity. Their proof, which uses modular forms and other things, that's where the new ingredients are, but at one crucial moment, it uses Ziegel-Landau. And it uses it seriously, and therefore, they don't know when this starts to happen. So we know that at some point, we will represent every odd number, but we don't know when that starts happening. But we really want to know when it starts happening so that then we could go and check all the numbers up to there, because it's easy to see if, say, we know this was bigger, once we're bigger than 1,000, then we could actually completely know which numbers are represented. So we do not know this effectively. 
and you can see the importance of the entrance of this lack of knowledge of that lower bound or of what is called a Z possible Ziegel zero. So this is the kind of application that the Ziegel-Landau theorem is, uses, and if you could get rid of if you could get rid of the problem of the Ziegel zero, you would then solve this kind of problem. That's just one example, and uh, of course I choose these carefully. I think it's the nicest example. I mean, I'm giving you what I think is the one that will impress you the most. Okay. Now, in this discussion of how zeros influence arithmetic, or vice versa, let me look at other zeros. So Dirichlet just was worried about L1 chi, and it was Riemann who took seriously the function as a function of a complex variable. So for example, if chi is 1, this is that series I already mentioned, that's that product. And what Riemann discovered, and uh, I was outside here looking, and I noticed that uh, the book that, of Landau that's open there is exactly the discussion of the functional equation of this function uh, for the Riemann zeta function. Here's a, uh, it's open up on, on, on a proof of this statement that I'm about to give you, that if you take the function ls chi, chi is primitive, but ignore that, and you multiply it by the gamma function, shifted by a number which is 0 or 1, depending on whether chi is even or odd. You have a q here, which is very important, q over pi to the s over 2. This function is entire. Let's assume now chi is not 1. So I can just say the words, it's entire and it satisfies a functional equation in s into 1 minus s. And it's still today, unfortunately, the deepest thing we know about the Riemann zeta function, for example, in these is the functional equation. And this is really a consequence of Poisson's sum, and that's Riemann's paper. But Riemann goes on, he's trying to understand the influence of these zeros on primes. The prime number theorem was not known. He goes on to conjecture, but Riemann doesn't conjecture in a vacuum. Let me add this. He conjectures that all the zeros of the completed function lie on the line of half. So this is the well-known Riemann hypothesis, and this is an excellent conjecture. Uh, in the sense that it's falsifiable, somebody puts a zero off the line, and it's all over. It's not a theorem which has any unknowns on both sides. It's not a bijection between two categories of something or other. It's, <laughs> it's a real conjecture. And Riemann checked the first ten zeros, and I want to show you a remarkable influence that misled all of last or Riemann and pretty much all people last century, you might say every mathematician believed and every physicist knew what I'm about to say, and it's of course false. Um, and it's the influence of the first zero. So Riemann already determined the first zero was on the line, and it's 14 point something is its ordinate. The zeros, he conjectures, are all on the line of half, and the first ordinate is extremely high, and we're going to discuss the lower ordinates, which is why <coughs> I bring this up. So Riemann checked the first few. That was not clear from his paper, but it became clear from his nachlas. What is Riemann's formula? It's a relation which is today very simple. It's just logarithmic derivative, complex analysis. But at the time, I suppose, complex analysis was still being developed. And it's a formula for the primes. He wanted to explain how you might prove the prime number theorem. He didn't prove it, but he gave what was the key idea. And the formula coming from the uh, partial fraction or the logarithmic derivative of the zeta function is if you sum log p, p to the k less than or equal to x, which uh, if k is 1, I'm counting primes and they're counting with weight, counted with weight log p, and p squared less than x is only size square root x, it'll play a role here in a second, then his explicit formula is x minus the sum over the zeros, x to the row over row, where those sum of all the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, including the trivial ones, which I hadn't uh, allowed earlier. This is a conditionally convergent series. Of course, he doesn't prove it con converges conditionally, though he was very interested in the conditional convergence of Fourier series. But he didn't develop the tools. He was just uh, giving the big ideas. And that's why he was so interested in knowing that the zeros are on the line of half, because then this term is x to the half oscillating with these x to the i gammas, uh, what we might call today an almost periodic function, Bessikovic squared almost periodic function, if the zero is on the line of half. And the main term is x, and it was well known, it's easy to see that psi of x divided by x tends to 1 is the same as the prime number theorem, which is pi of x, the number of primes less than x, is asymptotic to x over log x, the way we like to think of it, but for the purpose of what I'm about to show you, and Riemann already gasped in conjecturing the prime number theorem, did not write x over log x, but wrote, now people ask me, why do you choose 2 here? I have no good answer to that. <laughs> uh, you could write 3 there. But you, if you start writing something like 10 to the 320, you'll upset my next slide. So put 2 or 3. 
2 to x dt over log t, and that's a logarithmic integral. That really is the right term that you should weight things by rather than what it's asymptotic to if you want to look at fine structure. So Riemann outlined the proof of the prime number theorem. His interest in the Riemann hypothesis was exactly that that would imply the prime number theorem, but of course he wasn't able to prove uh, the Riemann hypothesis, as you know. The prime number theorem, however, was settled this way. I don't know where I took this from. I found it just before I was leaving, but there's a graph of Li of x for x up to 1,000 and pi of x. And you can see the approximation of pi of, is asymptotic to Li as a prime number theorem, but you can see that the approximation is rather good. You can also see that Li of x is bigger than pi of x. And that's the thing I wanted to point out, that last century everybody believed that pi of x will always be less than Li of x. And in fact, we know today that we're almost certain that the first place where pi of x, well, let's look. You increase x. If you make x tend to the 4, pi is that, and li minus pi. Doesn't look like it's changing sign. And you can increase x to a rather large number, and you can go in your computer today as far as any machine will compute. And in fact, we more or less know that up to 10 to the 300, it'll never change sign. But that doesn't mean it's true. So this is the danger of numerics. <laughs> the danger. It's a great uh, theorem of Littlewood, early part of the century, that in fact this changes sign infinitely often. As I just said, pi will, uh, this will first, for the first time this will only happen around 10 to the 320. So we're not going to see it happen in this world. But we know this changes sign infinitely often. And Rubinstein, who's here and I a few years ago, uh, looked at maybe how often this happens. How often, in, with respect to dx over x, is pi of x bigger than li? Since it takes so long for the first time to happen, you might think that the, and it was a conjecture of some people, well-known people, that in fact it's 0% of the time, that pi will beat li very seldom. In Littlewood's proof, it'll cross and then cross back quickly. But in fact, that's wrong. It's not so small. Pi of x, if you had to have odds and somebody's chose x at random, that's the odds you should give. It's a small percent, but it's not 10 to the minus 320. So once it overtakes, it does so on a more regular basis. All right, this is Littlewood's theorem. And what I wanted to point out there is the effect of a zero on the distribution. The reason that people were misled is this re the fact that that first zero of the Riemann zeta function is so large. You see, psi of x, it's more natural to count prime powers from the zeta function, so you'll have p less than or equal to x plus p squared less than or equal to x. The oscillation term here is psi of square root x, and the p squared less than x is psi of square root x. And so there is a bias, that's the bias we see already to have uh, pi less than li. And then the question is, can this catch up and overtake? Now, because the first zero is 14, it's that big, this oscillatory term has to wait a tremendous long time before all these frequencies line up to catch up and overtake. And that's the idea of Littlewood's proof, is to line up all these frequencies to use Kronecker's theorem in, well, he doesn't need Kronecker's theorem, just dynamics in an infinite dimensional torus. So it's a very beautiful result, and uh, it's analysis. All right. Now, if the, zero, if the zeros control the arithmetic of the primes so much, let's uh, ask about the distribution of the zeros and what controls them. And that really is the theme of these lectures. And I'm going to, in the next two lectures, explain all these details. So here I just want to explain the features for a more general audience. So I don't want to go into any technicalities, and the best is to talk a little vaguely. So let me say this without going into details. One of the most remarkable discoveries about the zeta function since Riemann, phenomenological discoveries. There's a lot of fantastic work about the zeta function. The Riemann hypothesis sits there very singularly. And there's a lot of great work to, uh, to prove theorems which would use the Riemann hypothesis and get around that and still prove the theorem you're after. This is where the subject has been very successful. But for the Riemann hypothesis itself, it doesn't look too good right now for this century. I know people have taken bets about whether we solved before this millennium is out. Well, if you looked at published work, it's, it's not too encouraging. But there have been some remarkable discoveries, and the one I like very much is uh, the discovery, which I will call the Montgomery-Odlitzko law, that the local spacing, and I'm going to try to explain this in, in, 
in some detail, between the distribution of the zero, the spacings of the zeros. So you go high up on the zeros and you look at the ordinates. Let's assume the Riemann hypothesis if somebody's doing an experiment, then he's finding them all on the line like Otlitzka. And you look at the spacings, and they are not random. They do not behave like random numbers. Now, when you model, you always assume things are random, and that's how you predict your behavior, and you might even use that as heuristic. So when something is not random, it's telling you something. And the remarkable thing here is what, following a very important little paper of, Mon of Montgomery, Odlitsko makes these computations, he finds that these are not behaving like random numbers, the zeros, they're behaving like eigenvalues of random matrices. And it's telling us something, and I want to try to portray to you what it's telling us. I want to try to explain why that's the case. Yeah. What? I'm going to go into great detail to that in the second lecture. And this is, it's not omission, no. Symplectic, Katz and I understand. <laughs> but that's what I'm driving at. Now, uh, since Katz is here, he can vouch for this. We have a book which uh, I carried across the Atlantic, and if you write a book with cats, it seems like it grows. He's got a philosophy that books should, you should never remove anything, only add. And it's heavy, and I have one copy here for anybody who wants. And the subject matter of the book, which I'll describe in the second lecture to some extent, is to explain the phenomena, this, uh, the distribution law, the Montgomery of Let's Go Law, if you wish, in a case which we understand much better, where we know the Riemann hypothesis, it's the function field case, but it's a case which in number theory has served to guide us in the real case. And of course, that doesn't mean that it's just a toy thing. These things have their own applications back into number theory, so they are very important. And what we were able to do was to explain what this, to prove this, uh, the, let's say, an analog of the Montgomery at Let's Go Law in the function field. And there are key things that come. Most, most importantly uh, is a certain symmetry which comes out of monodromy Sim and, and the distribution of the zeros are dictated by certain universal laws and certain symmetries. And that will be the topic. And I can't say that without adding that the kind of ingredients we use there besides the fact that we know the Riemann hypothesis in situations like this, we also know much more structure about equidistribution of Frobenii, theorems of Deline, things like that. And they are all, so Deline's work in particular is a key tool here. But there is a symmetry, and the symmetry is what explains this theorem. So what controls the distribution of the zeros in the fine structure is a symmetry, and I want to discuss the symmetry, but for families rather. Now here I can mention again something about Landa. Early on, you look at a book like Titchmarsh's book on the zeta function, this book only talks about the Riemann zeta function, nothing else, not even the Dirichlet L function. If he has a Dirichlet L function, he does it by mistake. To him, it's all analysis and it's all vertical. Landau, I think, was, if I'm not mistaken, at least I haven't checked this myself, that he's the originator, but people do say this, and I assume it's correct, that he was the first to point out the analogy between the Q, which means if you look at the Richler L functions, for example, and you increase the conductor, rather than increasing T, there's a similar kind of feature. And today we understand that the Riemann hypothesis actually for number theory is not that interesting. <laughs> now that's the kind of thing, uh, with that recording there, and somebody proves the Riemann hypothesis, and then uh, he said it wasn't interesting. No, it, it would be one of the great theorems, there's no question. But we really would want it for all the Richler L functions. It's in the Q aspect that it's most useful in arithmetic. In the conductor aspect, the Riffle L functions, counting progressions, modular forms, I'll get into them. That aspect is the arithmetic side of the subject, much more than the vertical, in my opinion, anyway. And these group methods that I'm going to discuss very much immediately bring in families and symmetries. So we don't look at one L function or zeta function. So far, I've just talked about the Riffle L function, zeta function. We very much bring in families. And let me tell you the first family, the simplest of all. You would want, perhaps, to ask the simplest question of all. And we're going to change the question a bit. This came naturally out of what we were doing in the function field. So I, for today, now forget the function field, except to say that everything here is predicted and motivated first by that. But then we can come and try make statements and prove statements, as we will, in the case of the rationals, which is where I prefer to live, okay. So let's go back to directly L functions, just with a quadratic character, and there's this technical condition of primitive. 
And let's look at the zeros, which presumably on the line a half, there's a Riemann hypothesis, as I said, for each. So just for the purpose of me describing what I wanted to say here, assume that the zeros are on the line a half. So the zeros of the form a half plus i times some ordinate. And I index them by j. And I'm interested in what controls the distribution of the zeros. We've seen the zeros control arithmetic. What controls the distribution of the zeros? So some analysis, which I will explain next time, tells you that as you increase the conductor, this feature that, uh, that uh, Riemann found that the first zero was 14, that's because this is the most, that's sort of the, the first born zeta function of all. The minute they're born a little bit later, which means they have this, this period, Q, the zeros start to trickle down, and they actually have to start to converge to the point a half. In fact, they come down roughly like 1 over log, so it's best if you want to see the distribution and understand a fine structure question, you have to multiply the lowest zero, gamma 1 Q by log Q over 2 pi, giving you a real number. So for each Q, and Q now is square free because I want this to be primitive, for each square free integer, I have a number, and I could ask how they behave as I increase Q. So I have a family of L functions, and what's the distribution of the low-lying zeros, as we call it? What is the distribution for the low-lying zeros of the family? Now, motivated by what's in the function field, we find that this family has an infinite dimensional symplectic symmetry. Uh, there's no really infinite dimensional thing in this picture. What happens is we obtain the symmetry in the function field case as a limit, a scaling limit, of finite dimensional symplectic groups. So somehow these zeros in the function field follow some symplectic laws. And one asks, one can ask, is that true in the number field? And the remarkable thing is all evidence we have, and it's quite a lot by now, is that it does. And in fact, this thing I put up, I think, last, maybe a few years ago when I gave a lecture here, Rubinstein, is, who's here, check this. He let Q, so this is the kind of experiment that Orlitsko did. This is not as, it's not using a cray. He's just blocking all the Princeton computers up. Um, he lets Q go up to about 10 to the 10. That's about the limit here. And for each Q of that type, he looks at the lowest zero. Of course, if he found the zero off the line, I would have started the lecture that way. <laughs> so all the zeros on the line, he looks at the lowest zero and, uh, and multiplies it by log Q over 2 pi and asks for its distribution and draws a histogram. And on the other hand, Katz and I have computed the scaling limit of what the answer should be if it followed the symplectic rule that we know it follows in the function field. And it's this curve here, which is not an elementary function, I emphasize. So this is not something that you can uh, just sit there and say, oh, that's what I expect the answer to be. So when it fits, you're very happy. This is given by a Fredholm determinant on an infinite dimensional space. And it so happens that it has an expression in terms of pain lavey functions. But there's no way this is going to fit unless the theory were right. And if you vary the problem, as I will explain, the theory is consistent. So that fits well, and that's just another phenom phenomenology. This is phenomenology, just like what Litzka said found numerically, that the, the distributions are what they should be. You could say maybe this is just a good predicting mechanism. And I will certainly return to that. It certainly seems to be a good predicting mechanism anyway. <laughs> All right, so that's the kind of phenomenology we find. And in order to really test this theory of the distribution in families and to bring it more into other arithmetic questions, I want to look at more families. That family is certainly one of the basic ones, but it doesn't have a feature which will be emerging here that there's one point, actually there are a few, but there's one point that I'll highlight here, algebraists like it. There's one point of vanishing that has another conjecture going with it, which is another excellent conjecture, which I want to describe. And I have to move in that direction. So let me allow more general families. I know I'm talking to a general audience, so let me give you examples. So we had the zeta function of Riemann. We had the Dirichlet L functions. And now we'll look at something a little more exotic. Let's look at uh, this function, the discriminant, or what Ramanujan studied in detail. You take this product over Q, and you write Q is e to the 2 pi i z. You expand that in a power series. It has coefficients tau of n, Q to the n, where tau of n are integers, and they change sign. And they're multiplicative, which is a conjecture of Ramanujan, established by Mordell. And it turns out that this function of Q, or, or function of z, rather, is a cusp form, let me remind you what that is, of weight 12 for the full modular group. I'm giving you an example of a modular form. 
This is a function which, if you apply linear fractional transformation, AZ plus B over CZ plus D, where ABCD are integer, mat in, uh, uh, integer matrix of determinant 1, then it, this weight 12 means it transforms by CZ plus D to the 12 times delta. So this is a modular form. It's got a remarkable symmetry. It's like a periodic function relative to this group SL2Z. Not like, that's what it is. And to any modular form, one can associate an L function, which in this case is just tau of n. Now I, uh, for all algebraists, I like to normalize, as do all analysts, I believe their functions have functional equation s into 1 minus s, 1 half is the middle, and I will stick to that, because otherwise I'll get very confused. So I divide by n, n to the 11 over 2, n to the minus s, and uh, the multiplicative properties of tau are encoded in this product. And what's different here, just for the uninitiated, this is a product which, if I factorize, is a product of degree 2 in p to the minus s, as opposed to the Dirichlet L function and the Riemann zeta functions, which are Euler products of degree 1. And Euler products of degree 2 come out of modular forms on our path plane. And this is an entire function, satisfies a functional equation. This is all really stuff revived by Hecker this century. So there's an example of an L function which Hecker showed this, uh, an L function who's got all, which has all the conjectures that the Riemann zeta function and the Riechle L function had. It's got a functional equation. Okay, so we have, a, our zoo has increased a little bit. Well, today you can't talk anywhere without saying elliptic curves, I suppose. So let's say elliptic curves. So suppose I have an elliptic curve, which I'll put in a form like this so that we can all recognize it, though when it's best to work in homogeneous coordinates and have points at infinity. But this must even be defined over Q, so that means the coefficients here concretely are in Q. And let's let EQ be the set of rational solutions to this equation. And it's a remarkable thing that goes back to the Greek, that you can add points here. So this is not just a set, it's a group. And if I look at this over the set of the field with p elements, then it's still a group. And let me neglect bad primes, besides the license I have in such a general lecture. <laughs> uh, let's let a p be the number of points minus p plus 1, or if you write it in this form, the number of affine solutions minus p for the good primes. And you can formally piece together these local pieces of information on the elliptic curve and form an Euler product of degree 2. And that is, the, if I defined it at all places, would be the L function of the elliptic curve. And uh, many of you probably watched the BBC movie of which you see some really high good acting by some of my colleagues. <laughs> uh, I don't know that any of us can act to save our lives, but maybe they fooled you. Uh, and if you did, you would know what the Shimura Taniyama conjecture is, and you'd know who Wiles is. Uh, it is by now, and for my purpose here, every L function is modular, let's say. It's not quite proven, but it's proved for most, for many elliptic curves. So we have an L function of modular form, of an elliptic curve. It's supposed to be an L function of modular form, and this is a beautiful family in the context with which I'm talking. I'm now trying to talk about families of L functions for which there's supposed to be, according to Katz and myself, some symmetry, and that symmetry should dictate the low-lying zeros. And why am I moving to such a family is that that symmetry with the low-lying zeros are the zeros near a half. But the zeros at a half have special meaning for such an example, which is why I turned to it. Just to explain it, it's not necessarily we can look at other families, but here's another outstanding conjecture. It's nearly as good as the Riemann hypothesis. And it's called the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture. And it tells us from this local information that we put together, and, and now we can even talk about the value at a half, since Wiles so kindly has told us this is an L function that's good, that it says, I will ignore rank, I don't want to, I'll just state the simplest thing, that this doesn't vanish if and only if the set of solutions to that equation is finite. That's a great conjecture. I mean, if it's wrong, you can give an example. This might be infinite, and this might, not va uh, this might vanish. It's falsifiable. It's as good as any conjecture is. It's an excellent conjecture. I think there's a book by, I had shingles, and I was reading a book by Penrose about good theories and bad theories. He's re this, the naked emperor or something, or the emperor or uh, something. These, I don't know what he was saying. These are two excellent conjectures I've given you. <laughs> that, that I do know. Uh, 
And I should add that this conjecture, and it's not so well known, <coughs> was discovered only because computers came into existence to, for mathematicians in about 1960. And there was something called the Ziegel mass formula, which was underlying the, by the way, the proof of Gauss's theorem is essentially the Gauss, the sum of three squares is Ziegel's mass formula. And Birch and Swinnett and Dyer, if you read their papers, say they want to understand if an elliptic curve might have a similar feature like a mass formula. And what they do is they simply experiment. They take a whole lot of elliptic curves, try to compute if the order of the group of solutions is finite or the rank what they compute. And then co they didn't quite formulate it this way, but they discover it numerically. This conjecture was discovered numerically, pretty much like the Riemann hypothesis was discovered numerically. Riemann wondered if they're on the line, and he checked it. And I think we don't quite appreciate, when we get very aloof, the importance of experimentation, especially in something like number theory, which is it's, it's applied math. <laughs> OK. There are some results towards this conjecture, and I will use Colley Vargan's work later. They are due to Coates and Wiles and Colley Vargan. There are other results too, but these are the main results, which uh, give special cases of this. Now, I'm led to my third and final family for this lecture, and that's a family of L functions, which come, they're closely related to these elliptic curves, because the elliptic curve L function, I didn't tell you where it lived. I said it was from a modular form. Let me tell you where it comes from. So instead of looking at the full modular group, let's look at the two by two matrices for which the bottom left corner divides is divisible by n for each integer n. Think of n as prime here. This is a subgroup. It's called the Hecker congruent subgroup. And we can form a Riemann surface, h divided by that. It's got a certain number of cusps and a certain genus, which I think I want to call g naught of n. And let me point out that the genus is easy to estimate. You can write down a closed formula for it. It's roughly n. And I'm going to be interested when n gets large. This is a Riemann surface over the complex numbers. More interestingly, it also can be defined over the rational. So it's a curve over the rational numbers. And like any curve, it has a Jacobian, also defined over the rationals. And I'll write j naught n as the Jacobian of x naught n. And it's a little more complicated than an elliptic curve. It's called an abelian variety. You can add points here. And you can ask whether the set of points on this over the rationals is finite or not. It's the kind of question that people have studied. And the modular forms for gamma naught n, I will divide as follows. So let S2 of n be the set of holomorphic Hecker eigenforms of weight 2 for gamma naught n. So these are holomorphic functions up our plane, which transform by that subgroup, but have CZ plus D squared. And they satisfy some other Hecker conditions, which ensures that they have an Euler product. Uh, we not, we, we, I would never call anything that doesn't have an Euler product a zeta or L function. That's called a series. OK, an L function must have an Euler product. Uh, otherwise, it's not, an, it's not an L function. OK, so the, the situation here is a little more complicated for this family in that the coefficients are real, the way I've set it up. And uh, the coefficients uh, of the series defining this, like the analog of the tau p's. And the functional equation might or might not be, it it's, might be even or odd. That is, L of 1 minus s, as I pointed out, I normalize everything to a functional equation s into 1 minus s, and with a completed part here, of course. Functional equation will have a sign, and there'll be an epsilon, which is plus or minus 1, and roughly half of the guys will have even functional equation, and half will have odd. And I break up the space of these, this finite set, which has got order g naught of n, the genus, into these two sets. And they roughly, it's very easy to verify that asymptotically half are even and half are odd functional equation. And of course, the ones with odd functional equation automatically vanish at a half. And if they come from an elliptic curve, like I was saying, then the rank, uh, then there should be infinitely many points on the curve. But we have no idea how to show that in general, even that, even that simple consequence. Now, according to uh, Katz, and, well, I'm pushing, he's here, I better be careful. According to our theory, I'm, I, 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 I'm, let's say, read more into it than he does. And he's much more cautious than I am, let's put it that way. This should have an orthogonal symmetry. I'll describe that in the next lecture, what that is. And as a consequence of this orthogonal symmetry, we should have, um, I ignore immediately the ones without functional equation because they vanish. And there's an interesting story to them, but I want to get back to the z equal zero. Let's look at those with even functional equation. They may or may not vanish. And in particular, it follows from these considerations of the low-lying zeros, and in particular, the zeros. This is all prediction, let me make clear. 
the zeros add a half, that most of them should not vanish, meaning the percentage of them which don't vanish when n gets large should tend to 1. And it's a very interesting problem to see if you can actually establish this, and I'll tell you why in a second. All right, so here, so that's predicted by the symmetry, and I now want to describe a theorem that uh, Ivanius and I have been mulling over for a while now. It's still being written up, but it's, uh, uh, it's safe to say it's correct. And it's the following, that while we can't prove that conjecture that almost all don't vanish, this is a hard thing to prove. Right, now let me just clarify a few things. I've explained that the point a half is important, whether we vanish there or not. Also, the Riemann hypothesis, of course, does not preclude us vanishing at a half. So it's a very subtle issue whether we vanish at a half. So when we try to show that we don't vanish, it's not going to be easy. Yet, we are able to show that the limit, meaning that, that at least half of them don't vanish. Not only do at least half of them don't vanish, but the values of the L function at a half are quite big. The method of proof actually doesn't only show you that the L function is not zero, but that is actually rather large. The value is real, and it's bigger than log n to minus 2 for at least half of them. So many of them don't vanish, and I'll explain some applications to arithmetic in a second. But our, we must confess our interest in this was that if we could establish this theorem, and this is why we worked on this hard, for any number bigger than a half, remember the conjecture says it should be true with a percentage one. If we could establish this for any number bigger than a half, then there are no ziggle zeros. And the world is marvelous, and the other theorem is effective, and we would be very happy people. We opened a few bottles of wines too early. Uh, the point is that we have hit a barrier. The analysis seems to hit a barrier, though it's not like we understand everything. But when I show you the algebra, there's always the chance that algebra may see you through here, though it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's, it was a, before we even started this, we knew that the percentage we're going to need is 50 percent to win, bigger than 50 percent to win this game. Somehow we were led up, and when you start this kind of thing, in, in, the, in the his, other kind of problems of this type, like Selberg proved that there are infinitely many zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the line a half. This was a celebrated theorem during the war. But his percentage, he didn't even declare for you it was so small. Later, Levinson gave a proof that one third on the line a half, but no significance has ever been given to the percentage. Even if you proved 100% of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function on the line a half, I personally don't know any application. And here we are, when we started, we knew we had to get above a half. And before, and we got up to a half, but we, and then, of course, you start to tighten all the screws to go over a half. But uh, the, there's, a, there's a wall. Somehow, we uh, have been led there, but we're not led into the promised land, let's say. <laughs> uh, maybe we will be one day, but anyway. That's what we know, that at least half of them are not zero, and if you could replace that by anything bigger than a half, then in fact there are no zero zeros. Well, such results are, and this point of this lecture is to show you arithmetic applications of zeros. So I want to give you one application to the abelian variety J naught N, that abelian variety of X naught N over Q. Now, if you look this has been studied at great length, most notably by Mazer in a paper in the IHS on what he called the Eisenstein ideal, where he looked at J naught N, this abelian variety defined over Q, and tried to find big quotients which have finitely many rational points in them. How big a quotient can we have of J naught N which has still the property that it has only finitely many points? So let's let M naught N be the largest quotient of J naught N for which the quotient has finitely many rational points. How big is M naught N? Now in view of what are we doing here, of course that's, you'll see in a minute by various translations, this is just translations, is interesting, but uh, in Mazer's work, uh, and later Morel, who made an ingenious addition to it, the key thing that Morel did was to show that there's a bigger quotient. Mazer had his hand on some piece, I'll show you what they look like in a second, and Morel was able to look at a bigger piece in order to prove theorems about bounding torsion on elliptic curves. But in any way, this is a fundamentally interesting abelian variety, and we're asking how big a quotient will have only finitely many rational points on it. Okay, I should say that the method of proof of this, it's my job to talk about lambda, I assume, 
The method of proof of this uses the notion of a mollifier, amongst many other things, and the mollifier actually was introduced by paper in Land by Landau and Bohr in connection with the Riemann zeta function and was taken to another level by Selberg, the idea of mollification, and it's something that is used here. Uh, okay, let's set it. All right, so we want to understand how big this quotient is. Some Brummer has made some very interesting computations for this. So these are primes up to about 10 to the 4. I, only, I stopped at 2,000 and something. He only looks at n prime, at least in the table that I have. And he computes a deficiency, which is the cardinality of s plus n, which is the even functional equation, guys, minus the dimension of m naught n. The biggest m naught n could be is this s2 plus n. And this deficiency is how much smaller it is. Remember that it's related to the number of vanishings, if at least we admit conjectures for a second. So let's just compute this deficiency here. And for all primes not in the list, the deficiency is zero. For many primes, this piece of this abelian variety is simple. It has no factors. But there are primes, and luckily for Shimura Taniyama, this, this thing is not simple for all n, otherwise it couldn't accommodate elliptic curves. And there are ones, and there are many primes, infinitely many primes presumably, where you do have the thing break up. And when it breaks up, it could be that you have some deficiency. Brummer conjectured that the ratio of this, in, in this language that I'm talking about, the ratio of this biggest quotient, which is finite rank, divided by this dimension, tends to 1. And we're trying to understand the dimension of this. And as I say, Morel, uh, Mesa, of course, had some bounds for M naught N, showing it grows like a log, roughly. Morel got N to the 1 8th. Bill Duke got N of a log N squared or something. And we, for the reasons that I'm mentioning, were able to get a percentage, and percentage is even the number 1 half. So as a consequence, you immediately get the following corollary. When you apply some machinery, we don't do anything on abelian varieties, we do analysis. <laughs> but if you combine it, I'm not, if you combine it with known results of Kali Wagen, you can show that this big, there's a quotient of size at least one half the size you expect, which is rank zero. So there's this very big rank zero quotient. And let me immediately add, so this is the kind of result that where zeros influence uh, arithmetic, yeah, before any algebraists run home to try to prove there are no Ziegel zeros by just trying to get any number bigger than a half here, which I would love to have reduced it just simply to extending that number to any number bigger than a half. Uh, I want to emphasize that our deduction of there being no Ziegel zeros is unfortunately demanding a little more, and that for reasons that experts, it's not just a question about ranks, it's a question about Shah as far as we understand, I'm afraid. That is, it's not just that we want the numbers not to vanish, but we want the numbers to actually be quite big, meaning bigger than log to some power. And if you put that condition and translate it into algebra, which you can, you're not just asking about ranks. There's much more chance of, of getting over 50% maybe algebraically, but when Shah comes in, uh, I think it becomes much harder, at least I understand it becomes harder. All right, so I think that uh, is roughly where I wanted to get on a general background lecture. I hope what I've given you is a flavor of how arithmetic, uh, how zeros affect arithmetic issues. It's clear the zeros affect the primes through a Ziegel zero or through this Birch, Winnet, and Dyer. What I want to do next time is describe what I said were these symmetries and describe some of this function field. And then the predictions that makes about the distribution of low-lying zeros, to which we now have a good number of results proving those partially. And then in the third lecture, I will describe in detail how you approach this theorem that I described of Ivanich and myself about proving many don't vanish. Now, thank you.
going to explain, but briefly, briefly. Uh, in the work that we do and what we're now doing also over the number field, we do not look at one function. So I moved from taking just the Riemann zeta function to look at a family. And somehow there's a symmetry group of the family which dictates the fine structure of the distribution of the zeros. So what dictates the distribution of the zeros, well, by the way, what Ivanich and I find here is somehow that Ziegel zeros can affect the distribution of zeros. That's one issue. But there should be no Ziegel zeros. So really what should affect the distribution of zeros is some symmetry. And the symmetry group is going to be something that will be well defined in the function field that's only associated with a family. So what I take, when I, if I want to understand the symmetry associated with the Riemann zeta function, I must put it in the smallest family for which I can understand the answer, and then at least I have those symmetries imposed. So when you look at the Riemann zeta function as part of LS chi, where chi is squared is 1, we certainly have all the evidence in the world that LS chi, where chi is quadratic, uh, has an infinite symplectic symmetry, but let me be clear, I don't have an interpretation of the zeros and a group acting on some uh, uh, Hilbert space which gives us. What I have is consequences of symmetry imply certain distributions and we will prove those distributions. Or, uh, or I gave you an example of a phenomenology, meaning numerically it's been checked and I will show you theorems which prove that that is the right symmetry, which distinguish a different class. So since zeta sits in this very small family for which the symmetry is symplectic, we convinced that zeta is typical in the family. But there were, I will have to admit that a lot of this is, uh, I'll show you in the next lecture, the lecture, what I can prove and what is certainly conjectural. Do you get some specific space, like space over the function field? In the function field, this uh, one knows, of course, uh, linear algebra, spectral interpretation of the zero. By the way, all this reinforces extremely well the general picture that the zeros are a spectrum of something. They're not random numbers. They are eigenvalues of something, but they come with a symmetry group which we are already identifying. With knowing very little information, one sometimes can still identify the symmetry because it leaves its signature. That's the point. But in this picture, what is the symplectic space that we get over the function field? Of the function field, the monodromy group. Oh, well, it's just the first cohomology group, say it's curved. Yes. The first cohomology, the intersection pairing of cycles, gives a symplectic structure which is preserved by monodromy. But somehow it um, should go to infinity when you... We do. The genus goes to oh, infinity. Okay. Ah, you, 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 you genus comes to infinity. Yeah. Right. The number field only knows genus go to infinity. You must have more and more zeros. Ah, okay. So, so, but Q is fixed. Yeah. Q is the characteristic of the field. Yes, no, in the theorems that are proved now, Q is varied, and that's a very great weakness both, that I'll explain. Both Q, and, both Q and genus. Q, and, Q and genus, uh, that's, uh, we can't do it with fixed Q. That's correct. When yes. I explain those theorems, I will also explain their defects. <laughs> correct. He, he's putting the knife where it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> described as the weight of being uh, k, uh, here in Jerusalem we call that uh, half of k. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, no, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I mean, the weight 12 really in, in, in the, language, the local language is weight is... Uh, yeah, it's true, uh, uh, actually uh, uh, I think Sarah in his standard book. So uh, no one should... What's it called at 6? So no one okay. people should be... Should I be equal to k. k. As a holomorphic form, it's a form of... Uh, yeah. It's a sixth power of a canonical. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. One further announcement. Uh, first of all, I